Hello, um, it's Tom and Finn back for um, another reading from D-Day Dog. Um, but from now on, I'm going to read two chapters a day. Um, so it's 21 and 22 today because, um, <laughs> excuse me, it's getting near the end of term. I want to make sure I get it all, get it all done. So you're lucky today. You are so lucky. And I can see how thrilled you look. Two chapters today. What a lucky boy. Anyway, so here we, here we go. So chapter 21. There's a dog. There's a dog. Lucas was shouting so loudly that all the children had stopped where they were and stood looking at him. It was a large dog, a wolfhound, something like that, barking loudly as it ran at speed through the waves that were hitting the beach. Even though Jack could see the dog was playing and wasn't a threat to any of them, he recognised the panic in Lucas's voice and remembered his friend telling him that French dogs have rabies and could kill you with a single bite. That's not true, by the way. Jack jogged over to Lucas. He could solve this. Lucas, come with me. No, Lucas said. Then he was shouting again, bending to pick something up off the beach. There's a dog, he said. Then that was when the dog looked over and slowed down. Jack could see something in its eyes. It was interested. A bit like that. Jack knew that dogs liked excitement, that they were drawn to people calling out and picking things up off the floor. They can't see you now. Hang on. You need to be able to see how much he's enjoying this story. Um, there's a dog picking up off the floor. Where was I? Which was exactly what Lucas was doing now, grabbing stones from the goalpost, ready to defend himself. So now the dog was coming, veering towards them, inquisitive. Whatever sort of game this small boy was going to play, the dog wanted to join in. And as the dog raced towards them, Lucas began to throw stone after stone at it. That was when Jack heard Cassandra scream, Stop! Don't hurt the dog! Jack looked across at her and remembered another conversation from the previous day. Cassandra had been so upset about her own dog being hurt, and Jack desperately wanted to stop her feeling bad again. So Jack lunged at Lucas, pushing him to the floor. Then he grabbed one of the sticks they'd been using as a goalpost and stood over his friend, drawing it back. Stop it! Jack yelled at, at Lucas, standing frozen in his attack position. Jack never intended to hit Lucas. He just wanted to scare him to make him stop throwing stones at the dog. An arm came around Jack and snatched the stick from his hand. Jack turned round to see a pair of angry eyes, Mr Salah. Then Jack looked back down at Lucas and saw how he was lying on his side, arms over his head, legs pulled up to his stomach, his mouth wide open and a terrible scream coming out of it. The rest of the class were led quickly to the bus by Mrs Mace and Mr Thompson. Lucas was with Miss Khan, but Mr Salah kept Jack back. But Mr Salah kept Jack back away from the others. Jack noticed that the driver was watching them, smoking his cigarette, leaning against the side of the bus. I know things are difficult at home, said Jack. Mr Salah said, I know that, and I've been really pleased so far with how you're coping with this trip, but this, why would you do that? I just don't understand. Jack shrugged. I need to know why, Jack, Mr Salah said. This is serious. You pushed him over. If you'd hit Lucas with that stick, you could. Well, I don't know what. Jack knew what this was. It was Mr. Salah giving him a chance to explain what he'd done. You're going to fall off if you're not careful. Just don't. Finn, 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 Finn. Everyone's watching. Look. Look. There. They're watching. Relax for a bit longer. Good boy. What a good boy you are. Very good. Sorry. Giving him the chance to explain what he'd done. And if Jack told him that Cassandra had opened up her life in Syria and that she was upset about her dogs, Mr Salah might understand. Jack might even avoid punishment. But Cassandra had been very clear. Jack was not to tell anyone about their conversation. Do you think I need to change my reading style anyway? 
So I'm going to read it to you now. He's there listening. Jack, Mr. Salas said, his voice less patient now. Why did you do it? There was a reason, Jack said. What is it then, Mr. Salas frowned. Was it to do with the beach? I mean, Jack, this is where men fought and died so we could be free. So we don't have to fight, Didn't so we wouldn't have to fight. Do you understand how your behaviour might have upset people here? Jack stared out to the sea. I do, he replied. So why, Mr. Salah pressed. Jack didn't answer. He just stared out at the sea, squinting into the light. The waves were breaking in lines on the beach. Jack tried to imagine soldiers coming through the waves, falling one after the other. A great sea, a great a sea, the sea, a great tide of bodies. One last time, Jack. Why did you do it, Mr. Salah asked. I have to know how to respond to this, and you can help me. But if you can't give me a good answer, then there will have to be repercussions. I can't say. Jack shrugged. So that was the end of chapter 21. I'm sorry I messed that reading of that one up. Um, I'm going to, because we're about to do chapter 22 in the same reading, I'm just going to try and get the dog to come and join us because um, I'm sure you'd rather he was with us, wouldn't you? Right, so, just make yourself comfortable, Finn. So, chapter 22, the road, <laughs> you're right, good boy, sorry. The road was wide and long. Jack could see everything through the massive front window of the coach. Yellow brown crop fields stretching out ahead of him on either side of a long winding strip of tarmac. Above him, the coach was quieter than usual because of what he'd done at the beach. Jack was sitting in the front of the coach with the driver. Mr. Salah had made Jack apologise to Lucas, but Lucas had not even looked him in the eye or replied, isolation was Jack's punishment, being away from the other children. The driver had four things on a shelf between the two large upright seats. A takeaway coffee cup, a packet of cigarettes, a large bag of jelly babies, and a thick paperback book with the words Merville Battery on it. The book reminded Jack of something he'd read about D-Day. He couldn't quite remember what, but the Jelly Babies had his attention. He was hoping the driver might share them with him. But he wasn't going to ask. Jack stared at the road. He was thirsty. He put his hand on his throat. Do you feel sick? The driver asked quickly. Jack shook his head and looked at the man. He smelled of smoke. He had blurry tattoos on his arm and Jack couldn't see his eyes because he was wearing sunglasses. The driver raised his sunglasses and studied Jack. Well, if you do feel sick, don't do it in my coach, got it? Will you stop yawning? It's distracting thing. Jack scowled and turned his head to study the road again. They were on a two-lane road now leading to a roundabout. After more silence, the driver asked Jack, See that man in the uniform? Jack shook his head. Well, look up then. I don't want to, Jack muttered. You don't want to? The man's voice was harsh. No, Jack said. The driver stopped talking and began to steer the bus around a large roundabout. There's a statue in the middle of that roundabout, the driver said. A man in a uniform. His name is Eisenhower. He's important. Just look at him. Because the driver's voice was softer now. Softer. Just look at him. Because the driver's voice was softer now, Jack looked up and saw the statue of a man in a uniform at the centre of the roundabout, hands on his hips, staring down the road. Behind the statue, there was an arch. Jack watched the driver control the bus so that it eased off the roundabout and onto another road. The course of history depends on your success, the driver said in an American accent. I've blown it again. Sorry, I'll try that again. I know, I'm rubbish at accents though. The course of history depends on your success, the driver said in an American accent. Jack didn't reply. He could feel the driver looking at him. Do you know what Eisenhower meant by that? The driver asked. Jack heard laughter from upstairs. He wondered if some of the other year sixes were laughing at him, stuck up front with a chain-smoking, nonsense-speaking driver. Do you know what that means? The driver said again. A flash of anger. I don't care, Jack snapped. The driver laughed, but it was a dark laugh, not a we're having a nice time at the front of the bus sort of laugh. 
You don't care what Dwight Eisenhower said to thousands of soldiers who came here and struggled up the beaches or parachuted in pitch darkness before getting their heads blown off. Jack felt cold, even though the sun was belting through the windows. He moved his feet, knocking the driver's butt. Sorry, he muttered quietly. He looked at the driver's arms. They were muscular. They were like thick pieces of rope, especially when he was turning the wheel. And Jack, like rope that Jack had seen at a seaside. A series of plaited knots. That's what they reminded Jack of anyway. And Jack wondered just how long he was going to have to sit with the driver. He just didn't know if he could bear it. So that is the end of the um, of chapter twenty two. So tomorrow, is, um, the next in the next reading is twenty three and twenty four. And your challenge for this reading is: um, how many times did Finn yawn during that reading? Um, I think I've got about eight, but he looks ever so comfortable now. Unfortunately, I have to switch the video off, so he's going to have to become. <laughs> down there thank you for listening and um so next week i think there'll be five readings five videos each will have two chapters on and i am to finish by friday what um friday the 10th okay thank you for listening